main factors. On the one hand, vulnerability is determined by the frequency or in, uh, and severity of natural hazards. The second factor relates to the ability to deal with the impact of natural hazards. And this is a very important issue because later on it will bring us to the importance of governance and institution in these states. Thus, here we can see vulnerability as the outcome of the interaction between exogenous factors determined by, for example, meteorological or geological uh, characteristics, which drive the incidence and intensity of hazards, and the ability to deal with the impact, which is in turn a function of intrinsic elements that is mostly institutions. Okay, so. What are the main, beyond the geographical characteristics, what are the main uh, profiles and constraints of small island uh, developing states? Uh, here we can see that vulnerability can be defined or grouped into three main factors. One of them is uh, geography. They are, well, as I said, they are geographically constrained. Uh, also, they are very under, uh, they, they suffer from, uh, high concentration on production and output, and that's mostly because of their ge geography, which can uh, unfortunately not be changed. But also, uh, some don't have the, the necessary capital to foster the diversification of economic structure. And uh, despite these issues of fragility, most of these islands are very open to international trade. But this also presents other element of vulnerability, and that is the, the reliance on, on imports. Uh, and very, um, very, very volatile exports earnings. So this is a very important aspect of the of the project, which we look uh, in, in another in a separate uh, um, book and journal special issue. Okay. So here, uh, as I said. Um, Again, we mentioned the issue of natural disasters. For example, in the Caribbean, almost 4 million people were affected by natural disaster during the last 20, 30 years. And uh, both some countries show that they have the ability to bounce back <coughs> from negative things. But both, unfortunately, in most cases, the population size is a constraint and the economic structure, as I mentioned, is a constraint. Now, they don't have the institutional capability to deal uh, uh, with emergency. And also, most of these countries face very highly, high volatile macroeconomic performance. Uh, in this case, high output volatility has adverse impacts on long-term long growth and also on the poor, as we will see later. So we look at different uh, elements in order to analyze the economic vulnerability of uh, small island developing states. Uh, the first one, or the most obvious one, is to look at real income. Here we have uh, some data on PPP terms. And uh, we can see small islands display a very high dispersion of per capita income, both within and between regions. For instance, in the Caribbean, Haiti is the poorest country and is well below the, the median. In the, in the Caribbean and in the Pacific as well. Kiribati uh, is very poor in comparison to the higher income uh, country in that uh, island that is Tonga. Also, uh, as a, the, the medium differs between regions. For example, in the Caribbean is over $7,000 uh, in PPP terms, whereas in the Caribbean is uh, just near $3,000. But this is just one part of the story, and I will not be tempted to, to pay attention just to this. Uh, in the book, the authors and uh, also in the project as a whole, we pay a lot of attention to the issue of macroeconomic vulnerability because in this case, the design of economic policy becomes vital in order to complement other international efforts to, to help uh, development policy. For example, here in this graph, we compare, we compare developing countries as a whole, that is the green line, with uh, other groups like the Small Island Developing States Group and the Least Developed Countries Group, that is the 48 countries defined by the United Nations Developing, uh, Development Policy Committee. And uh, as we can see, high volatility of real GDP growth is the hallmark of poorer countries, including small island states. For most Caribbean and Pacific islands, growth, growth remains subdued at less than 4% a year. 
And also, important here is that poor countries have more frequent and more severe growth collapses, as the figure shows, in comparison to developing countries with higher, in with higher income. For example, this could be attributed to the interaction of unequal income distribution and the high trade specialization, which is related to the abundance of natural resources and the size of the economy. We have to remember that most of these islands are microstates, and despite having some of them high income status, they don't have the ability to diversify or to cope in case of external shocks. Also, economic volatility has significant poverty impacts. Some of the studies in the book show that economic volatility affects more adversely the employment and income of less skilled workers who do not have adequate coping mechanisms. The absence of government-funded and well-targeted safety nets uh, accentuates the problem, and uh, here comes the whole issue of uh, building beyond resilience, building, building states for the long term. Um, so macroeconomic policies should aim not just, as pri uh, not just to target price stability, which is the usual objective of macroeconomic policy, uh, but also to stabilize output and employment, especially when shocks originate from the supply side. So beyond, um, unfortunately, we cannot see the name of the, there were some issues when we changed the, the presentation to the, to the program here. But here I just wanted to, to show a comparison of uh, the poverty levels uh, using the standard headcount of $2 a day. The first bar, I will uh, tell you what it is. The, te the first bar is South Asia, the percentage of the population uh, that um, lives uh, under $2 a day, and it is around seven, over 70%. And South Asia is closely followed by Sub-Saharan Africa, and then the third will be Haiti. The level and incidence of poverty of Haiti is one of the highest in the world, and is the highest in the Caribbean, as uh, the figure shows. Then uh, the, the fourth uh, region will be East Asian Pacific, then Latin America and the Caribbean, then Middle East and uh, North Africa, and the bottom bar refers to Europe and Central Asia. So here we see that one, uh, of the Caribbean island is one of the poorest countries in the world compared to Sub-Saharan Africa, which, uh, which drives most of the attention of international development policy and poverty analysis. Okay, here we compare some uh, island states, both from the Caribbean and the Pacific, also looking at poverty rates. And uh, the figure shows that a large number of people live just above the poverty line, and this implies that any shock to the economy can push them to extreme poverty. So again, this is why uh, the study in vulnerability and fragility is a, 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 timely, a timely issue when it comes to digging the, the sources of, of, of poverty. Okay. Another aspect of the study, uh, although it's not dealt in detail in this book, but it was in other, in other uh, of the outputs of the project, is the importance of the international responses and especially capital flows uh, in case of shocks in a small island developing states. Our study clearly shows that international capital and resources, both private and public, played an important role in a small island developing states and on poor countries. Here we have a comparison again of small islands, lead developed countries, and other developing countries, and also regional comparison, that is African, uh, small islands, Pacific, and Caribbean. As we can see, aid remains the most important source of finance for small island developing states as well as, well as for least developed countries, especially so in Africa and the Pacific region. For example, some islands in the Pacific, they receive the highest share of per capita <coughs> aid in the world. And, but here we can see also that remittances remain important in developing countries and in recent events like the global economic meltdown, one of the channels through which developing countries were affected was by the, the loss of jobs or re of relatives living and working in, in developed countries. Therefore, the, the, the remittances were reduced. So later on we will see that especially there are some Caribbean islands that rely heavily on remittances. Uh, 
going back to the issue of aid and foreign resources, we know all here that the aid debate is very polarized, and this is beyond the, the objective of, of, of this story. We know that aid certainly can help to eradicate poverty, but there is also the pessimistic view uh, of this curse that holds that aid is useless. But here we can see that you cannot, um, these countries have uh, and re rely heavily, and in some cases over 20, 30 percent of GDP on these resources. So the importance here is uh, that these countries not, cannot access um, private capital flows in the same dimension as more advanced developing countries or wealthier developing countries because they are marginalized, they have poor institutional performance, and they cannot simply attract capital flows uh, from, the, from the competitive or market-based uh, sources. Okay, I briefly come back here to the issue of natural disasters and five here... Minutes. Five minutes? Okay, okay, I have to run. So here um, we have uh, a comparison of uh, the number of events and also considering the size of the countries or, or, the, or the population size and how they, they are affected by these shocks. So here we see that the fact that the spatial concentration of economic activity in general and production capacity in particular is higher in smaller countries, and this contributes to the significant damage that can occur. Uh, as I discussed earlier, the Caribbean region is one of the most uh, prone to, to, to natural disasters, and uh, if we look at the issue on a global scale. So here we have that the smaller, smaller islands in the Caribbean, they, they have uh, experienced at least one natural um, disaster per year during the last 30 years. So if we try to make some sense of these events, here we can see the economic cost and the destructive impact of natural disasters in some Caribbean countries. And in some cases, for example, San Lucia, we can, we can see that the impact has been over 300% of GDP. Uh, we added some recent estimates of the cost of the earthquake in Haiti here. According to the international community, it's around 15% of GDP, but we think that that number is uh, somehow conservative if other costs beyond economics are considered. So quickly going through the impacts, um, there are obvious impacts to the, and damage to the natural environment, including both product, to productive activities, especially agriculture and tourism, but also to the physical infrastructure, as the case of Haiti recently showed us. Uh, there are very important social impacts that cannot be overlooked. For example, the loss of human life, disruption of public services, migration and break up families, uh, risk of disease, lack of access to health and education facilities, and the destruction of public infrastructure are, are, are the key issues. Not just in the recent events, but in the historical uh, studies that are presented in the book. Um, a key message in the, is that um, repeated setbacks resulting from the destruction of economic and social capital perpetuate the poverty cycle and can act as catalyst for turning natural hazard into natural disasters. Also interesting, and I think it's a, another important issue for development policy, is the demography of the impact. And here we show that women suffer the most. Um, they are already poor when the when the when the shocks uh, affect the country and therefore they are a higher risk. Uh, here we show that uh, over, they represent over 70% of the world estimated 1.3 billion poor. So basically uh, I will leave it there and uh, just I will um, perhaps back in the discussion I can, I, I can come back to some issues but uh, what have we learned and what, uh, from the book and also from recent experiences and like the Asian tsunami or the Haiti earthquake is that there is not a silver bullet to tackle all, all these challenges, but a key issue is building countries for the long term. It's not just the issue of responses when the, on the, when the disasters emerge, but building policies and, and that can help to tackle the challenges of 
low diversification of production and also the issue of poor infrastructure. Also, we learned from this and from complementary research that South-South cooperation or the cooperation between countries is important, especially because most of these islands, they come together uh, and they team up to negotiate, for example, with northern partners, free trade agreements, but the scope to regional cooperation is there. And they, they could complement each other, especially because of the large diversity and the difference in sizes and, and wealth, as we saw by the, by the, by the numbers. And finally, we and we and I would like to to present some gratitude to the to the people involved in in this event. I think we can can go back and and say something quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your attention.